Thanks for tuning in at Coastal Christian Ocean City. For more information on anything going on here, you can visit our website at ccoceancity.com or check out our app in the App Store or Google Play. Today, Pastor Matthew will be bringing the message. So without further ado, here's Pastor Matthew. Chapter 3 is a perfect contrast between righteousness and lawlessness. John makes it clear that you can know which camp you're from by the way your habits are formed. One is either sinning habitually with no concern for Calvary, or they're living in victory because they recognize the work of the Holy Spirit intimately. You see, to love Jesus and others proves our right standing with the Father. So we're going to pick up where we left off from last Thursday, so do not worry. If you weren't with us, you can actually follow along with me in the beginning. I'm going to do a preview or a review, preview where we're going, review where we've been. The review, we talked about this confidence that we can have before God. How do you have a confidence before a holy God? Well, the Bible says that you can approach him boldly yet humbly as his child, and you can actually seek aid, mercy, grace for your very needs. How is this possible? How do we have access into God's presence. Well, Jesus, in a word, Jesus tore down that veil or that partition or that dividing wall that separated sinful man, you and I, from a holy God. When Jesus went to that cross, of course, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus's flesh was the veil. And because it tore, he gives us and grants us access He's the holy priest who has gone before us, this holy priest who can empathize and sympathize with us in our weakness. We serve a God who knows everything you are going through, has felt it, yet sinned not. This is not a God who rubs our face in our mess, in our failures, in our sin. No, but this is a God who can relate to where you're at, the struggles that you might be having. We serve a God who can understand. So much so, I even dare to say, We serve a God, we call him Father, who knows what it's like to lose a child. When he allowed the son to be killed, this was not far from the father's heart. This plan set in place before eternity was a way for him to redeem mankind, though we deserved it not. John is saying, I want you to have confidence and assurance that you know this God. Do you tonight know this God? with assurance, with confidence, with boldness that you are his child. John uses litmus tests throughout his epistle, many of which we've already covered in chapters one, chapters two, and we're ending chapters three. And he's basically saying, you want to know that you can know God? Here's one. By this, you can know love, the way Jesus laid down his life. And since he laid down his life, you can lay down your life for the brethren. By living a self-sacrificial life, you can experience God's love. We should never get so desensitized to the gospel that we stop examining this love. We should be with wide eyes in wonder of this love that God divinely condescended, came into humanity, wrapped himself in flesh, actually was a babe in Bethlehem, grew up into teenage and eventually young adulthood, and all of the while feeling what we feel fully man yet never diminishing his fully godness. And in this, the gospel is executed. And we believe this according to the word of God. How do we authenticate all that I'm saying right now? It's the word of God. Historically, traditionally, the word of God is the story of God's redemption upon man. And the believers that claim this Their lives follow. Your behavior follows your belief. If I believe this, I am going to live recklessly, unashamed about this. I have to move since the gospel moved me. Do you have assurance of that, confidence of that? Do you know this Jesus I'm talking about? John then says, hey, you want to know how you live a self-sacrificial life? You got the world's goods, provisions, resources, not abundance, just you have some, and you see a brother in need, yet you don't meet that need. He goes, how's the love of God who met your deepest need spiritually, how is the love of God in you if you could see somebody in need and completely be unmoved by that need? It's the word compassion. It's maybe your pain in my heart. The way I feel your pain, your need enters my heart. I mean, that's how this all played out. 
God felt the pain of humanity and decided to do something about it. Then we entered into this assurance we can have before God. And then it enters us into this area where it says, hey, you might be doing all the good works that God wants you to do, but you might still feel not worthy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You might be doing everything God wants you to do. You are coming to church. You're serving. You're receiving the word. You're worshiping. And there's something within you that still doesn't feel worthy in God's presence. And the Bible says, oh, yeah, by the way, your heart can't be trusted. It's the word conscience. Sometimes your conscience can condemn you, and it's not accurate. God is greater than your heart. God is greater than your conscience. But then he goes, if your conscience does not condemn you, you have, back to the main theme, confidence toward God. So when we put all that together in a phrase, confidence toward God is predicated upon having a good conscience with God. A good conscience is a pure conscience, maybe a clean conscience. And the only way you can have a clean conscience is if the cross of Jesus Christ sanitized your conscience. Because this world will want to deafen your conscience. Let me define conscience for you. Conscience is two words combined. Con, with, science, knowledge. Put those together, with knowledge. Proverbs 1.7 says, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In other words, the more you fear God, the closer you get to God, the more vibrant your conscience becomes. Here's another definition for conscience. Internal alarm for right or wrong. It's an internal monitoring system that needs to be monitored that tells you right or wrong. Now, here's the sad irony in the nature of progression or progressive America, we see deafened consciences, consciences that are seared, where we call good evil, and we call evil good, where we invest resources and voices and energy and protests into preserving the life of the ozone, yet we don't put that same effort into preserving life in the womb. Did you, did you hear that, church? We are more concerned with gun laws than we are about introducing God back into law. Amen. In the name of progress, we are a land that kills our own. Because there's no conscience. The conscience has been deafened, justified, or formed by culture and not scripture. Romans 2 talks about God has put a conscience in all of humanity, so no one is without excuse. The conscience goes, there's something greater than you. Look out into the clouds. Look at the sky. Look at the mountains. Look how vast the ocean is. You think that you are the creator of you? There's something beyond you. And when man suppresses his conscience, what are we capable of? When there's no monitoring system within me, morally, governing me, determining the decisions I should make, how do you get a vibrant conscience? The Bible. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14 will tell us, beginning in verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, right? You are Christian, you are believers, you are studiers of the scriptures, you are dis disciples is the word, students of the word. You should be teaching this stuff. Really, Matt? Yeah, moms, dads, we should be educating those below us from the scriptures, but he says, notice, you need someone else to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, which is fine. The oracles of God, the first principles, look at me, ABCs, one, two, threes. Those are the building blocks of education. You build off of the rudiment. You build off of the basic. We don't stay on ABCs and one, two, threes. Here, the writer of Hebrews says, here's the reason why. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The reason why many of us choke on meat is from lack of study in God's word. The reason why we're offended when a minister goes out of the word of God and makes it relevant according to the culture and how the world is spinning off its axis. And we go, I can't believe he said that, I'm offended. The reason why we choke 
on meat is because we don't know God's word. And here the writer goes, here's what you need to do. Solid food belongs to those who are mature, full age. That is those who, ready? By reason of use, practice, habit, have their senses, their conscience exercised to discern both good and evil. How do you get discretion and discernment? The word of God. It's God's voice in your conscience that tells you, oh, that's right, proceed, or that's wrong. Now, I said last Thursday, of course, you can't always trust your conscience because your conscience can condemn you. That's why God is greater. God's insight and God's knowledge into your heart is greater than your conscience. But by and large, I need to make sure my conscience is vibrant and active. That way I can have confidence before God. You know the conscience fund, the IRA, has a conscience fund for those who want to send in their tax frauds. They send it in. Over $3.5 million have been collected in this conscience fund because of Americans going, something was gnawing at them. Something was telling them that they cheated and they have to clear their conscience. So they send the money back in, obviously anonymously. But isn't that interesting? I heard of a, 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 a tragedy in 1984 a plane crash in Spain. They discovered the black box and the recording on the black box, the final moments before this crash, the monitoring system speaking to the pilot in an automated voice saying, pull up, pull up. And then you hear the pilot's voice back saying, shut up, shut up, crash. And all of us have been hardwired with this internal monitoring system. And it might not be saying, pull up, pull up, but I'm telling you what it is saying. Look up, look up, look up, discern the times that we are living in. Look to the one who brings us our peace. I need confidence before God. This word confidence can be defined as, ready? This is interesting. Confidence and boldness in the Bible are defined as plainness of speech. Freedom of speech, candor, openness. I said, that is so remarkable. When I have confidence before God, toward God, most likely it's probably because I am speaking freely to him. Speaking freely to him and speaking frequently with him. Now here's the equation. Those who speak frequently to God or freely to God are those who will speak freely about God. Those who spend more time frequently interacting with God will be those who speak freely about God. In Acts chapter 3 and 4, chapter 3, you got Peter and John who heal a man who's begging, of course, at the temple's step. And here's what happens. The religious authorities swoop in and, and they detain these two. They basically ask them the question, by which name did you do that? They say, by the name of Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, nobody was supposed to use that name. It would have been a, an offense or a crime to mention the name of Jesus. Now, here they are, unashamed, to mention by which name we did this. And then Peter gives this sermon. In the face of hostility and persecution, he says, the name, the name of the one that you guys killed. He then says, he's the chief cornerstone, the one you rejected. He then says a very popular verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation in no other name, no other name given amongst men by which we shall be saved. And then one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness, now when they saw the freedom of speech from Peter and John and realized these were untrained, uneducated men, it says they marveled. Now, here's the reason why they were speaking fluently about their faith, boldly, unashamed, in spite of consequences and persecution. Here's the answer. You ready? And they realized they had been with Jesus, Acts 4, 13. And they realized that they had been with Jesus, and they noticed there was a boldness about these two that they couldn't learn in a textbook. You can't learn boldness in a textbook. doesn't matter how many degrees you have. doesn't matter how many years of school you have. This boldness and this confidence can only come when you spend time with Jesus. I wish 
that if somebody was going to remember anything about me, they would say, he spent time with Jesus. Oh, him, I could tell he spent time with Jesus. Her, I could tell she is one who spends time with Jesus. Now, if we put all this together, conscience, confidence, communion, one word, closeness. All of this has to do with closeness with God. The closer you get to God, the, the more you can hear God's heart, God's heartbeat. And of course, when I hear his heartbeat, that's his will. When I leave his presence and I go throughout my day, I have an understanding of the pulse of the Father's will because I spent time with him. This is the reason why John says in 1 John 3, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Underline that. You could take this verse to the bank, but when you get there, or actually before you get there, you should make sure you check the signature, who signed it. You wanna know why? Because this verse right here is a verse that a whole movement has been created out of. It's called the Word of Faith Movement. You ever heard of NAR? Not NRA, NAR. It's the New Apostolic Reformation connected what is called the Word of Faith Movement, which is saying faith is a force. And based on your words, you can create your reality. You can frame your world by the words you speak. In other words, the way you speak, the na name it, claim it, you say it, and it's yours. You say anything in the name of Jesus, and you will have it. And they take verses like this, and they skew it out of Scripture, and it's created such a heretical movement in faith where people think they can call out to God, attach a tagline at the end of their prayers, in Jesus' name. I heal you in Jesus' name. Oh, God's will is to heal, but God's will is to heal the heart. There are tricksters out there. We call them charlatans. You'll see them all over YouTube. Their greatest trick is going up to people and saying, can I pray for you? Yeah, sure. God told me that one of your legs is shorter than the other. Google, how many people's legs are shorter than the other? Answer, over 75% of humanity's legs, one is shorter than the other. That's three out of four. And okay, can God lengthen a limb? Sure he can. But if God can lengthen a limb through a man, lengthen a limb, lengthen a limb, let me say it again, lengthen a limb, then don't you think through that same man who believes in the name of Jesus that he could kill cancerous cells in a body? Pastor, why are you telling us this? Because the shepherd isn't only supposed to feed the sheep. The shepherd is also to protect the sheep. To remind us what we are to have a conscience to discern good and evil about. The word of faith movement puts faith in faith. But the Bible says your faith needs to be in Jesus Christ. Here's some verses that we take to the bank, but we check the signature on the check. John 14, verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, we're on to something here. John 15, verse seven. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. That's a huge part of this verse. If you abide in me and my words are in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is kind of like Psalm 37, four. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he's the one that gives you the desires of your heart. But this is how this works. When you delight yourself in the Lord, when you love him, when you spend time with him, your desires become his desires. And it's his will to do his will. So he's going to grant you the desires because they're his desires, not my desires. Delight yourself in the Lord. Verse 16 in that same chapter, John 15, 16. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you. That's the word ordained you, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. John 16, 23 and 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. 
What's all this ask in my name stuff Jesus is talking about? Again, it's not a magical incantation. It's not a magic formula. It's not a genie in a bottle. I don't throw in the name of Jesus on the end of my prayer and expect God to hear me because I mentioned in Jesus' name. I got to understand what, that's, what that even means. Praying in Jesus' name is praying as Jesus would pray. It's praying in his authority. It's praying in his integrity. It's praying in his righteousness. The only way I can come to the Father is based on his righteousness. Not anything I've done. I pray in Jesus' name, understanding he's the one. It's his word. It's his will. It's his way. It's his righteousness. I have nothing to offer. I come trusting my life in your authority and your integrity. And this is what we say at the end of those prayers. Your will be done, not mine. Your will. If it's your will... I want it. God's will, of course, is always the salvaging of the soul. This is in 2 Peter. It says, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. What is God waiting on then? God is not willing. God is not willing for any to perish. But that all would come to repentance. What's God waiting for? God's will is for no one to perish but that all would come to repentance. One day, just to be very clear, every disease and every sickness will be healed and cured. Whether God and his prerogative chooses to do that now, one day, every single disease, every single sickness will be cured by God. On that day, that will be the ultimate healing of humanity, those that chose Jesus Christ. This is a pretty interesting story. Matthew chapter 5, and again in Luke 7, different angles to the same story. We're dealing with a centurion, Roman by nature, of course, coming to Jesus and asking him to heal his servant who's paralyzed. Jesus says, I will come to your house and heal him. I will. The Roman soldier then makes this statement. He says, I am not worthy for you to come to my house. I'm a man under authority. And I tell people to go and they go. And I tell my servant to do and they do. If you say the word, that is enough. What was he doing here? This Roman soldier was seeing authority. He saw Jesus' authority. He had nothing to offer. He came and placed his life in the authority of Jesus. He says, you're a man with authority. I see that. I'm a man with authority. I know how this works. I say, and people do. And I'm asking you to say the word. And I, I have faith in your word. He didn't have faith in his own words. It wasn't him naming it and claiming it. It was faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus highlights this man. says, there's none like him in all of Israel with such a faith. Let it be done according to what you've asked. This is a lesson. What we're seeing here is basically what Jesus invited us into when we pray. When you pray, Jesus said, our Father who is in heaven, position of sovereignty, God, hallowed be your name, holy, sanctified. Your kingdom come. God's kingdom is his economy. God's kingdom is his, his way, his authority. It's his kingdom that is coming. And in this account, the Roman soldier is asking his authority and his kingdom to come. And of course, the will of the Father was for Jesus to actually manifest the kingdom's power in the healing of the Roman soldier's servant. You see, up to this point, the, the Jews were waiting for the kingdom to come. The Old Testament said when the Messiah comes, he will show it by wonders, by signs, by healings. And when Jesus was performing miracles, church, you need to get this. He was showing the kingdoms here, repent, and I have all authority. The authority over human nature, the authority over mother nature, and the authority over demonic nature. Jesus was the one who had all authority over all that. When he came the kingdom arrived. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we're asking for him to exercise that authority through our lives in the people and the places around us. Your kingdom 
come. I pray as Jesus would pray in his authority, by his righteousness, and of course, with integrity. And whatever we ask, we receive from him according to his will. But now John is going to give us some prerequisites. Notice the next part of the verse says, because we keep his commandments. If you were to change this around, it would say, because you keep his word. Because you want his will. That's what that means. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This is what John is getting the church and the Christian to understand. Because we keep his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, if you're relational, you'll keep my commandments. If there's a relationship here, the things I've asked you to do in my word, you will do out of relationship. You won't do them out of responsibility. You'll do it out of a response of humility. You will want to love others because I've loved you. We will get ahead in John chapter 5, 1 John 5, verse 14. John will eventually say, now this is the confidence, same word, boldness, that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, ready? He hears us. My question, are we asking God according to his will, his desires, or are we coming to prayer almost demanding of him to move because we don't know his will? And when he doesn't answer according to what we've asked, we, we turn on God and say, he's not for me. He doesn't love me. If he did, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. And all the while, because we don't know his will and we don't know his way, we completely miss what he's trying to do. Your will be done on earth as it's already established and fulfilled in heaven. God's will, if I was to reduce it, is that we would follow his way, his word. What's God's will for my life, Matt? Follow his word. Get in his word. Study his heart. Know his pulse. Get so in the word, and the word is so in you that when you are walking in your day, you are doing the Father's will. And here's the other side of that. God's will or God's way follows his will. You want God's way to follow your life? Get in God's will. Align your life with the word of God. Align your life with Ephesians 1.11 and understand the way that God does his work is always in accordance with his will. He does not operate outside of it. Now, what is the will of God? This is theology. You need to know this, church. Theology tells us that there is two wills of God. The sovereign will of God and what is called the revealed will of God. This is the revealed will of God. The sovereign will of God is defined as nothing happens apart from his control. Sovereign will. Nothing happens apart from God's control. Now, I don't want to say revealed will. I want to change that word to make a little bit more sense, at least with alliteration. The sovereign will, nothing happens apart from his control. And the serving will, the serving will of God is we control whether or not we play our part. Sovereign will, nothing happens apart from his control. Serving will, we control whether or not we play our part. In other words, you make a decision whether or not you will choose to do God's will. God's going to have his sovereign will working regardless of you, but you're serving his will when you choose to partner with him in the process. Let me give you a case study and an example. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. This is God. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, you ready? And I will do all my pleasure. That's God. What are you saying, pastor? You're saying evil in the world fits into God's sovereign will, yes. Your decision to partner with God's serving will makes evil be recycled for good in your life. Joseph, Joseph, I'm going to give you a glimpse of your future. Here's a dream. Joseph spoke his dream to his brothers. The brothers instantly were jealous of Joseph. The father favored Joseph, gave him a a coat of many colors. You know this if you were raised in church. They, of course, turn on their brother. They throw him into a pit. And all the while, when they push their brother with physical force into a pit, God's sovereign will was at work. 
than when they sold him as a slave. Erased his history with their family. Told the father that they're, they found this coat. Your son's dead. Sovereign will of God is at work. And while man is trying to cause evil, God is working his good through it all, weaving it. And then, of course, falsely accused. We talked about this personally. We said, you ever been accused of something you didn't do? You ever been rejected? You ever been betrayed? You ever had somebody point at you and say, you're this? And all the while, we go, why is God letting this happen to me? And you got to understand, he lets it happen because his sovereign will is at work. And he's got a plan. You can't see it. But if you trust it, you have peace as you walk through it. God was trying to get Joseph in a position of influence and authority. His sovereign will, he knew the end from the beginning. He saw Joseph in a position of authority that would bring salvation, a form of it, to the land. The Egyptians and his own brethren would find themselves being saved because this man was in God's sovereign will. Well, what's the serving will got to do with this? Everything. See, the brothers, when they pushed Joseph, they were in the serving will of God. They made a decision and they served God's will. And Joseph, he had a partner with God's serving will too because he got betrayed and he got accused and he ended up in jail. You better believe along the way, there was some bitterness that began to rise up, but Joseph had a decision to make. Did he wanna let that bitterness begin to overshadow what God was up to? Even though he couldn't see it, he had a dream in the back of his mind. And that dream was God's way of saying, Hope in me and not in your circumstances. Keep moving forward. I have a plan. I have not left you. I have not forgotten you. My sovereign will will eventually accomplish my glory and your good. But you need to keep your mind lifted up, lifted up. The serving will, Joseph was making decisions not to get bitter. He made a decision to serve the people around him. And all the while, the brothers serving the will of God by being on the other side of that equation. And Joseph, for 13 years, suffering successfully in a verse, the will of God, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. What was Joseph doing for 13 years? I don't know. I know what isolation feels like. I know what prison feels like. I know it was in the place of misery and chaos and violence. I know how that can very easily try to get into your soul and that can eventually dictate and determine your outlook. And then you become a complainer and everything is against you and you're bitter and you go, where are you, God? Or rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. What's the will of God for me in my circumstances? It's a choice to rejoice. Rejoice always. Pray always. Give thanks always, for this is the will of God. Now we see this actually manifest in Adam and Eve. The sovereign will of God was at work. This was not a plan B to actually send his only begotten son. God did not go back to the drawing board and go, what are we going to do now? Adam and Eve, they messed up. No, this plan was already in motion. We need to understand this. Them sinning and causing the entire world to fall did not catch God off guard. His sovereign will was at work. Sovereign will, again, defined as nothing happens apart from his control. But the serving will, Adam and Eve made a decision to disobey. And that served God's will as well. Now we see these case studies in the Bible and we go, well, if God's going to do what he's going to do, why does he need me? And a lot of Christians' posture will actually say, God's will be done. God's going to do his will, right? God's will be done. But we say God's will be done as an excuse not to do God's will personally. God's will be done in the election, so I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to get involved in my civil responsibilities. I don't like either candidate. Yeah, but which one is more biblical? Which biblical platform should we get behind as Christians? God's will be done, pastor. And all the while, I sit on the sideline, not getting involved with God's will. I don't like what the public school's doing. God's going to do his will yeah, but you should be just as involved in engaging what's going on at the school board level, what's going on in our community and our legislation. 
something happens that we don't agree with as Christians, we don't just sit back and go, here's our social club, God's will be done. No, we get out and we ask God to do his will through us. This is not about rallying. This is not about protesting. This is about being in the position to do Micah 6.8. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. This is whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his word, we do his will, and the, these things we do are pleasing in his sight. What are the things that we, to do, we are to do that are pleasing in God's sight? Jesus lived a life pleasing in his Father's sight. In fact, before he even did anything that was recorded, his entire, I guess, 12 to 30 years of age was lived in obscurity. We know nothing about those years. But then Jesus steps up and he gets baptized. And here's the scene. Jesus gets baptized by his cousin John and this audible voice from heaven, it's his father, as the Holy Spirit falls upon him. And the voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What had he done for 18 years that pleased the father? We can only kind of deduce the last verse says that Jesus went home and was subject to Mary and Joseph. In other words, he was obedient to his earthly parents. And when he stepped on the scene, the father was well pleased with him. Jesus said, when you see the son of man lifted up, you will know that I am he, I am God, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Jesus' heart was to please his father. Jesus could have made his own decisions, but he Every step of the way, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he made a decision to say, not my will, but your will be done. This was, a, this was an ex exclamation of excitement when he said, I don't want my will. I'd prefer not to go through this, but not my will. There was an eagerness for Jesus to partner with his father's will. The apostle Paul would say statements like this to the church at Corinth and the church at Coloss. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, our aim, our focus, ready? To be well-pleasing to God. Well, I just want to please God. I want to live a life that's pleasing to God. My heart wants to please him. My words should be pleasing to him. This is the church of Colossus, chapter 1, verse 10. That we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. The word worthy is the word axis in English like an axis, like the scales of justice. They're, they're, they're hinged on an axis. When we walk worthy, we're saying our lives are worth the weight of the gospel. Or let me flip it around. If the gospel has any weight in your life, your walk should be worthy. Your walk should be looking to please him. Paul would write to the church at Philippi, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Let your conduct weigh as much as the gospel. Does it have weight? Does it have any bearing? That's why those that do the things pleasing in God's sight are those who have God's smile upon their life. Would to God that we would live for God's smile. I'm a father now. My daughter is five months old today. She's an infant, but she gets her father to smile. You know, she's not working. She's not contributing to this household right now. She, she offers me and Sarah absolutely nothing as far as livelihood goes. In fact, she costs more. Yet when I see her, I can't help but to smile. It's not based on her performance. It's simply based on the fact that she's my child. And there are these things that she's doing without her even realizing it that gets the father to smile. Number one, her innocence. I look upon her and it's because of her innocence, I smile. Jesus said, hey, you wanna understand the kingdom of heaven? You'll never get there if you're not converted and become like a child, innocent, with wide-eyed wonder yet again about God. We've become so cynical, so skeptical, so critical. Church, we need to become biblical. We need to become innocent again like children. I don't have all the answers, but I know this. I have a good, good father. And you better believe when I come to that determination and my innocence of faith sees a good father, he smiles. 
know what else I smile about over Willow? Her dependence. Not only her innocence, but her dependence. She can do nothing apart from Sarah and I. We provide, we protect. I pick her up. She's fully dependent upon me. Even when she's screaming at the top of her lungs, the father smiles because she's in my arms. She is dependent upon me. Sarah called me earlier and said, we got a problem. She had two blowouts and there's doo-doo all over her car seat and all over the blanket. And I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I said, oh boy. Well, when I saw her in person, she got here, she gave me this little smile and I smiled. And I have no idea how I'm going to turn that into a spiritual lesson for the grown-up Christian. <laughs> See, the next layer by which she'll get me to smile is her obedience. Her innocence as a child, her dependence upon a father, and eventually her obedience. When we're obedient to the father, he smiles. When he goes, hey, go pray for that person, he smiles. Hey, love that person. I know you can't stand them. That's a hard boss. I get it. I love them, though. Go be kind to them. He smiles. I'd appreciate the prayers for Willow in the, the obedience department. She's still sleeping through church, but we're working on that. Psalm 147, verse 11, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. The Lord smiles upon those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I love that because it kind of leaves it fill in the blank. He who comes to God must believe that he is. He is what? He's whatever you need him to be. He is provider. He is protector. He is lawyer. He is governor. He is king. He is nourisher. He is sustainer. What do you need him to be? You come to him in faith, in faith, in Christ alone, and he will be whatever you need him to be according to his word. Now John is going to give a footnote. The footnote is at the end of your assurance and your confidence to be able to go towards God. And this footnote is reducing doing God's plural commandments to doing God's singular commandment. Interesting. Watch verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should love or believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. John goes, I don't want you to get so confused with all the commandments, all of the word that you have to look into and do. Here's the commandment that you believe active on the name, nature, authority of his son, divinity, Jesus, humanity, Christ, prophetically pointing to who he would be. It's the first time John strings all that together. His son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. This commandment is our enablement. Write that down. This commandment right here is our enablement. When we believe on Jesus Christ, we are enabled to love other people. We cannot love other people in and of our own love. Our faith in Christ alone produces a love within us that is not our own. It's not our own. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you seeing what's happening there? It's Christ that lives in me now, and it's his love in me that's able to love you. His love in me. Now, I talked about last Thursday, this amazing courtroom scene, which obviously, as many of you know, my personal story and testimony, it tugged deeply on the strings of my heart in both directions, both in being the recipient of extended mercy and grace and forgiveness that I did not deserve. But again, like I said, it brings me back into a position where I was the offender that afflicted a family with pain. But we watch it unfold where the brother of both them, Jean, his name was Brant, young man, was able to show the world what the gospel looks like. He couldn't do that on his own. He did not do that in his flesh. The flesh wants people to hang. The flesh is what calls out for justice. The spirit of God within that young man was showing a mercy and a grace that he understood he received. And he goes, who am I to withhold grace that I've been given? And he was able to look at the one woman who killed his brother and say, the best thing you could do is give your life to Christ. What? 
don't know if you noticed this, but the judge even got in on the compassion. And the judge was seen hugging this offender named Amber and even giving her a Bible and showing her John 3, 16 before she was be taken out of the courtroom. Now this is of course the gospel. However, if you didn't read what happened after that, the deafened conscience of progressive America in a organization known as Freedom From Religion Foundation, they complained to the Commission of Judicial uh, Council in Texas saying the judge's demonstration was unconstitutional and inappropriate in her role. And every other comment was about race. You see how the culture tried to overshadow grace, bringing up the question of race? The judge had to answer this accusation. Really? Unconstitutional? The judge gave a Bible, and that's unconstitutional? Do you know every single law on the books has its foundation in the Bible? The Ten Commandments? We turn the Ten Commandments into a million other laws on the books. If we get the Ten Commandments right, and then eventually Paul reduced it to actually one word, love. If we just loved, and this is unconstitutional to hand a Bible to an offender who is about to go to jail, but we should have given her more time. Christians on Facebook, I know them. Maybe you're watching tonight, writing. We shouldn't just focus on the grace and the gospel. We should be outraged by the injustice of the system. Really? Conscience formed by culture, not the scripture. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, lives in him, has fellowship with him, and he, God, is in him. I love that part. And by this we know that he abides in us. How? Tell me. By the spirit whom he gave us. Romans eight sixteen. the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We can have confidence toward God because his presence lives within us. This is like the final assurance. You want to know how you can have confidence toward God? His Holy Spirit within you. His Holy Spirit is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a person. His Holy Spirit within you grants you access to the Father. I remember being a kid and actually going to the Lower Township Police Department. And I was able to walk up to the actual dispatch center as a kid and they granted me access. And you know why they granted me access? It had nothing to do with who I was. It had nothing to do with what I did. It had everything to do with who I was in relation to the chief of police, who was my father. And I can walk behind the dispatch center and go in throughout the police station and all because of who my dad was. Confidence to approach an authority because I am his child. This presence of God within us purifies our conscience. That's what we need. This presence of God within us empowers our confidence. That's what we need. This presence of God within us covers our communication so that we pray according to his will. That's what we need. His spirit gives us access. His spirit gives us assurance. His spirit gives us assistance in our work and in our walk. And all of this is in accordance with his will. This is why we pray. Our Father who is in heaven, sovereign, in control, sovereign will, hallowed be your name, powerful, holy be your name. Your kingdom come in Christ, your son. Your will be done in my life because it's already done in heaven, established, fulfilled. Give me today what I need in your word, your daily bread, your sustenance, your provision. Forgive me for what I've done. And give me the mercy to forgive those who have may have sinned against me. Lead me, Father, not into temptation, because I will fail. Deliver me from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It's all yours forever. In the name of Jesus. Amen. As a church, we believe it is our responsibility to connect our community to Christ. So if you found this message helpful, we'd like to invite you to share it with your family and friends. We'll see you next week.